This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, and every 10th episode, we do something kind of special, kind of different. What we do is we go off topic. So regardless of which show it is on the Hartman Media Network, whether it be one of the financial shows, economics, real estate investing, travel, longevity, all of the other topics that we have, every 10th episode, we go off topic and we explore something of general interest something of general life success value and so many of our listeners around the world in 164 countries have absolutely loved our 10th episode shows so that's what we're going to do today and let's go ahead and get to our guest with a special 10th episode show and of course on the next episode we'll be back to our regular programming here we go it's my pleasure to welcome Douglas Vermeer into the show. He is uh, the author of several books and the new movie, How Thoughts Become Things. You know, I've talked a lot about this over the years, how at a very young age, I discovered Earl Nightingale, Napoleon Hill, Jim Rohn, Dennis Waitley, Zig Ziglar, and the rest. And thoughts do become things. Uh, they are matter, actually. <laughs> and we've talked about that on the show before. So Douglas will take a deeper dive into that with us today. Douglas, welcome. How are you? Hey, really good to be with you. Thanks for having me. And you're coming to us from Alberta, is that correct? You got it. Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, you know, we become what we think about, right? Mm. Is there anything else we need to discuss? Or <laughs> <laughs> Well, that is the foundation of it all. And I think that that's kind of a an interesting, I guess, place to start is that we become what we think about. But I think the challenge with most people is they really don't think about, I think, the two words, the how it happens, Right. And secondly, this idea of become, what that really means is change, right? So do we have an intention of where we want to go with that? Is it just something that, uh, you know, we're on autopilot about, or are we really like legitimately planning on a destination that we're going to be pleased with? And I think that's a really big question. That a lot of people don't spend a lot of time, quote unquote, thinking about, right? <laughs> they don't really look at that very carefully. Yeah, no question. Well, I guess the logical question is, if someone believes we become what we think about, and if they're not becoming what they want to become, where is it breaking down? Um, yeah. And maybe can we control our thoughts so that we become what we think about? Or are our thoughts somewhat out of our control? Well, you know, that's that's actually a really good question, too, because here's here's a couple things that I think people really misunderstand about thoughts. Number one, we are often told that, you know, we need to think these powerful, proactive, positive thoughts in order to manifest anything valuable in our life. And that's actually not true. In fact, the science behind it and what we demonstrate in the film is that our thoughts actually arrive in a duality. So there's a positive and a negative in every thought as it, as it arrives into our life. But thoughts at the same token are also very, how should we say, uh, responsive and reactive. For example, if I say the word dog, immediately everybody in, in, in the listeners are, are thinking about a dog, even though it was probably the furthest thing from their mind. So our thoughts are, let's call it, hijacked by stimulus around us all the time. So one of the things that I think is really important for us to recognize with this idea of the duality of thoughts, a positive and negative, and then the tendency of our thoughts to be hijacked, is that our thoughts are actually much more responsive to our influence of our environment than they are for what's really occurring in here. That's probably why you've heard it said that we we become like the five people we spend the most time with. Yeah, right? I quote that often, Jim. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, but but here's something most people don't think about with that quote is oftentimes people when we talk about thoughts they say, oh yeah, my programming. I I was raised in a crummy family and you know everything was terrible and I came from a difficult environment. The truth of the matter is, is the quote says, "Who we spend, not spent." So the truth is, is we're currently being programmed. Our programming is right now taking place. And if we level up our influences, our thoughts will level up. Now, here's something kind of interesting not a lot of people know about me. is I went out and, as a 19-year-old, I did interviews with more than 400 of the world's top achievers. Right now, the media refers to me as the modern-day Napoleon Hill. And the thing that was interesting is my background pre-interviews, right, like pre-meeting with these top achievers – 
Um, my family was very immersed in the poverty pattern. What I learned from my mom and dad was the rat race. My father worked in construction. My mom babysat kids in the home. And it was, if you want more, work harder. That was it, right? Like that was the methodology. And I found that as soon as I started hanging around with people who had a different perspective, you know, millionaires, billionaires, people who created, you know, companies like FedEx or Nike, Reebok, the Avita Group, Christian Dior, Joe Sheens, all the big name companies that they had a different perspective. It was a, a different kind of entrepreneurial mindset. And as soon as I started hanging around with those people, again, I became like the five people that I spent the most time with. So I started seeing possibilities again, back to this idea of a stimulus on our thoughts, because I was with people who thought powerfully, thought about possibility, my mind was also spurred and kind of, how should we say, prodded into that direction. So I think it's really important that we recognize that that influence that we have around ourselves, it's not something to be taken lightly at all. Right? I couldn't agree more. And that's why a mastermind group can be so valuable. Yes. Uh, or just being in any group where people are uh, achieving more, doing more, they're they're big, living a bigger life than you are, right? Uh, yeah. Because it's it's a it's a stretch. But does everybody have access to that? I mean, I guess maybe I'll answer my own question to some extent mm. because you know when I was uh, younger, I I didn't grow up with any of those resources or money yeah. or anything like that. You know, many times I was going down the wrong path. I, looking back on it, I think it was. And then, you know, I just discovered uh, Zig Ziglar and then Dennis Waitley. Mm -hmm. And so my mentors were virtual mentors. They weren't, well, I mean, I had some real life mentors too, but not in the prosperity vein. I didn't have any of those, but they they were, you know, virtual. They were like celebrities, you know, gurus, you know, so what what do we do about that? Hey, I mean, the the five people we spend in contemporaneously, as you said most of our time. with Yeah. And I, I love that you brought that up because you and I kind of have a lot of similar background here, right? Like I said, my father worked in construction. It's not like we were hanging around with all kinds of millionaires who could teach me these principles, but I'll never forget when I started doing my interviews with the world's top achievers, I got to one fellow who was, um, you know, part of our church and we had a chance to kind of get to know each other. And I'll never forget that inside of about six months, he said, you know what, you've asked me a lot of questions about success, but there's one question you haven't asked me that's going to change everything. I said, well, what's that? And he says, you haven't asked me who else I know that you should talk to. And so I think this is really an important principle that a lot of people neglect, right? We always hear this idea of, you know, we need to take a millionaire out to lunch. Well, the truth of the, the matter is, is one lunch will teach you a little bit but you really need an ongoing relationship and you need to get into those circles. So once, in my opinion, once you get into kind of this uh, mentorship sort of relationship with, with someone who's even just a little bit higher than where you are. Right. By the way, you know, I I, I just want to point something out Mm. too, Doug, you know, we hear this, uh, you know, take a millionaire out to lunch. Yeah, I think we need to adjust for inflation. <laughs> ain't what it used to be. You know, that's fair enough. Time. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. It's not what it used to be. <laughs> so, so folks, let's give you some new distinctions. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. If, you know, take a deca millionaire out to lunch. Okay, that's ten million on the <laughs> or a cent a millionaire, a hundred million. Fair you enough. Know, it's gonna be unlikely. Most people don't have access to a billionaire, right? But deca can be the, you know. Yeah. And, and I'd also, again, recommend it's not a lunch that you want. It's a relationship, yeah. right? right? Like it's an right. ongoing relationship. What I've kind of found is people who go out for lunch, I mean, they may get some tools, but when they head into the real world and they start hitting challenges, yeah. um, you know, I, I we've heard that that idea of your net work becomes your net worth. But mm-hmm. I'm going to suggest before it becomes your net worth, your net work must become your safety net, meaning mm-hmm. where you go to get solutions, where you go to get answers to problems that you're struggling with, maybe even opportunities and what have you. So we really need to have those people, let's call it as our dream team or our team supreme, to be able to give us the tools that we need to be able to really make some effective decisions in real life, right? Mm -hmm. So again, as I was meeting with those that I had access to in the beginning, right? Like I start, you, what do we say? You lift where you stand, right? Like don't go try and do something that's way out there or you'll never get it done, but start right where you are. But then ask that question, who else do you know that I should talk to? And for me, what ended up happening is as I asked that question, I started getting access to people like Warren Buffett, uh, Richard Branson, Oprah Winfrey. I mean, but I didn't know them in the beginning. I didn't even know who they were. Right. And even with this film, you know, getting access to people like Bob Proctor to put in the film or, you know, these guys, I didn't know them when I first started out, but it was always that question of who else do you know that I should talk to that kind of opened the door. So I I think that it's it's funny because we see a lot of the gurus right now on the internet saying that your highest value skill is to learn how to sell. I'm going to say that's kind of not true. 
your highest value skill is to learn how to create and maintain high level relationships because you'll never do a million dollar deal at a $10 breakfast. If you're mm-hmm. always playing at these smaller levels and you're content there, you'll never really have big doors open for yourself. Okay. So okay. So, so you, could, you know, one could argue that that's kind of a form of selling too, because we're all always selling. We're, yeah, we're selling ourselves, right? Yeah, sure. Sure. But, yeah. but how do we do that? What's, what's the how to on that? The ability, well, that's a good point. I, I like that you brought well, that up. L- l- let's do w- one idea on how not to do it. Okay. okay. And, and that's that fake it till you make it. Fake mm-hmm. it till you make it is the biggest lie that's out there. And it's funny because I was recently sitting at an event pre COVID with a friend of mine who's worth probably about 800 million right now. And at this event, it was a gentleman who was kind of purporting himself to be, we just said all that in a bag of chips, right? Like he was saying, I'm the next biggest thing and I'm so well healthy and blah, blah, blah. Well, we all know that true wealth doesn't speak like that, right? Like right, if you've got right. money, you don't have to flaunt it. That's or right it. there. For, that guy sounds like big hat, no cattle. <laughs> there you go. Big hat, no cattle. But here's the thing is, you know, if you're looking for support or looking to play with the big boys, they avoid that because they don't want it affecting their reputation. If someone has turned out to be a fraud or a phony or anything like that, then we really don't want to be associated with that. So this idea of fake it till you make it is completely wrong. Instead, what I'm going to suggest is that we need to be very, very teachable and we need to be sincere in the fact that there's things that we don't know. In fact, one of my really good friends before he died was Bill Bartman. And Bill actually was uh, at one point Forbes rated him as the 25th wealthiest man in the United States. Started out on welfare, got to be the 25th wealthiest wealthiest man. And when I talked to him about how he did it, he said, well, it was a matter of curiosity. In every room that he went into, he wanted to make sure that he was the dumbest guy in the room, right? And he wanted to be there to learn and to be a student. But he wasn't afraid to say that he didn't know something. And he didn't let his ego put him out as someone that he wasn't. And I think that that's a big challenge that a lot of people have in gaining these multimillionaire mentors is that they come in with ego and they already act like there's someone important or on top of the game, right? We need to come in and we need to, to, you know, be sincere where we want to go, but don't kind of upstage those that we are looking to gain knowledge from. Right. Mm-hmm. Very important. Okay. So the how not to, uh, yeah, yeah. How about the how to any tips? Well, on I, I, th- I think one of the biggest how to's let, let's put it this way. Okay. So a goal that is specific and clear becomes attainable and near. So I think one of the biggest things that people need to do before they get going with, you know, uh, acquiring mentors and these relationships, they need to have some clarity on where they want to go. Mm-hmm. Right. I also say, have some clarity on what you want to learn. Right. Because there's five pillars of wealth. Wealth is made either in business, real estate, investment, intellectual properties, or your networks. And before I go in to learn about how to build wealth in those areas, I should know which one is sort of my forte, where I want to go. It's kind of what Warren Buffett once said, right? He says, making money is not like like the Olympics where we get rewarded for level of difficulty. So we should jump low hurdles, like the low hanging fruit. So find out where your skill sets are, your passion is, where your talents, so to speak, are. And then we got to get clarity around who can support us in that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that clarity is probably one of the biggest challenges that most people have. Another thing that's kind of interesting, too. I remember when I was doing the interviews with the world's top achievers, I had this idea that I wanted to start a business. Now, remember, I was being surrounded by business leaders. So I, you know, I wanted to do what they were doing. And I met with a friend of mine who um, at the time, Ryan, he was worth about 300 million. And I sat down with him with, you know, the idea to get help on running my business. And I said, um, how should I find my customers, right? How should I do my marketing? How should I do my distribution on this? How should I do this, that, and the other, right? And he just kind of paused and I'll never forget. He said, I can tell that you're going to start a really small company. And I said, what? <laughs> like, that's not my goal here. He goes, oh, no, no. You're going to start a really small company. I said, well, because why Because of all that? the how-tos? Well, no. It's because he said of the selfish questions, they all included me. How will I? How should I? How can I? And he says, the minute that you shift from I to who, like who can help me with this? Who can support me with that? Who has the skill set? And start looking at building a team rather than an individual. That's all of a sudden when things are going to take off. And I think that's a big problem that a lot of entrepreneurs have is they try to wear too many hats and suddenly they, you know, they're burnt out. They can't do it all. Right. Right. Good point. Good point. Well, what else do you want to tell us about the movie? Well, we're really excited about this film because I think that the thing that's different about this film than any of the other films that either I've created or others have is we've tried to provide really practical tools on how your thoughts genuinely do become things, but maybe even more important, how do you stay focused with the thoughts that are more important to you? Once you've decided what you want in life, how do you really stay focused and, and prioritize things so that they're going to become automatic 
habits in your life that will create the results that you want in whatever area, not just wealth, but everything, right? And I think that this is a big challenge with people is, you know, they have this really good thoughts like, hey, I could start a business. But then 15 minutes later, like, eh, I don't know, maybe I don't have the skills and they begin to doubt and second guess. You, you know what I mean? Right. right. So how do you really empower yourself so that the things that you really want to do, the things that you really deserve to bring into your life actually receive fruition? Mm-hmm. And this movie answers that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because you're making me think of a, a buddy of mine who, um, you know, has good ideas and is motivated enough to try them. But the, the terrible thing about I just noticed his experience over the years is that every time a, he gets a hater or a critic, <laughs> he just quits. Yeah. And it's like because this one person like made a bad comment on social media or something, you know, it's just like you're, you're, him. you're yeah. like putting your whole life in the hands of some other judge that may that usually isn't a qualified judge. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and, you know, plus it's only one judge. And so, you know, like, uh, you know, well, it's also someone who's Supreme, one, what I the call Supreme it. court. There's there's nine judges. Right. Yeah. For but this reason. is also an incomplete judge because it's somebody who doesn't even have the full picture of what's going on in his life. So he's yeah, taking yeah, advice unqual- from an incomplete. Uh, yeah, yeah. Unqualified judge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's interesting. There's a couple sayings that I have. Number one, I totally disagree with all the gurus who say you're not really achieving anything great till you have some haters. That's really stupid advice. Right. And they all almost even encourage people to go out and look for haters. Right. Yeah, like, if you're gonna, little, like yeah, it's just a load of baloney. The truth of the matter <laughs> is, though, is I also find that um, I don't know about you, but I've never, ever received a check through the mail from a competitor or a hater. So why does their opinion matter? You need to focus on those who actually can pay you, right? Like your customers' opinions are are what really matters. And so I'm going to suggest that really just this whole culture that we have of haters, number one, give your haters so much value, they change their mind. Like that's a, that's a good place to start. And then secondly, recognize who your true, how should we say, team is, which includes your customers, right? And if, if you're getting advice from someone other than that, I think you're really allowing your ego to destroy your possibilities, right? You can be rich or you can be right. And the minute that we start receiving information from a bad source and giving it credibility is the minute that we're giving our power away. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Uh, at the beginning, you were talking about in I think you were talking about how like environment influences our thoughts. Absolutely. Right? And you took that to the point of who we who we hang around with, who we associate yeah. with, who we let into our mind. But it's also our actual physical environment. Too, 100% right? it is. Yeah. yeah. Actually, in, in the film, I love what Marie Diamond said. She says that your environment is like a three-dimensional vision board. I thought mm-hmm. that was really insightful. That's good, yeah. Because it's definitely true. As I, you know, I mean, I, I think it's not just, again, who we spend time with, but what? Everything from social media to the television shows to everything. you got to recognize that everything leaves an influence. And everything shapes us into what we believe is either possible for ourselves or impossible. And so I think... It really is just like your friend who, if, if he's going to allow influencers who he's never met, someone who has a, a hateful remark or a comment to allow it to fester in his imagination, of course he's going to stop, right? But if we empower our imagination by surrounding it with, I, I love the idea that you went with virtual people, the books that you read and the places that you go. Like, I mean, these are, are really like those five people that we bring into our life, right? Like we become like that. And so I think it's really important to, to surround ourselves with possibility thinkers and people that see greater things in us. So what I was going to ask you about that is that we can't, you know, we can't really Mm -hmm. control our environment in the three dimensional vision board all the time. I think we can. Well, maybe maybe not all the time, but but certainly a lot of it we can. Yeah. yeah, Yes. You certainly can control some of it. No question about it. But you know, if, if your surroundings, if you, if you live in a very bad neighborhood or just don't have the resources, it is, that can be a challenge, right? Well, so, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that that bad resource or bad environment kind of thing. Because yeah. I've actually got a friend of mine. He's a student of mine for our passive income training classes. And what he said is that he kind of came from a bad neighborhood as well. But what he would do is he would take his laptop and he would head downtown to one of the higher end hotels. Bro, and he parked you know, himself in the lobby, are you, right? Are you, you, you get what I'm this saying? Is, this is exactly what I told one of my, uh, my trainees to do years yep. ago, I, yeah. you know, we were in, we were in Newport beach, uh, California or in Irvine, California, right mm-hmm. next to Newport beach. And he, he was an agent that worked for my old real estate company that I owned. You know, I told him, I said, I want you to go to the four seasons hotel yep. and I want you to sit in the lobby and I just want you to observe people for a few hours. 
Yeah. And take it in. He he did that. And I gave him, you know, an Earl Nightingale book. And I said, this is, this is what you need to do. And he said that just totally changed him. So we have access, we have access to this. You know, maybe your environment is on your, the screen of your phone or your computer too. You know, maybe it's not even in real life at all. Right. But you can still see it. Right. We see other people being successful. You know, it's not some cosmic mystery how they got there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing that's interesting about success. Now, remember, I interviewed 400 of the world's top achievers, and we saw some very common markers reappear again and again and again. And here's maybe one of the most simple ones is you hear everybody say, oh, if you want to be successful, you need to think outside the box. I'm going to say, no, 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 no. You need to find the right box to think in. That's the difference. Because there there really is like, you know, if if we were to take all of those areas, whether it's business, real estate, investment, intellectual property, or your networks, there's some proven ways that have been working for centuries, not just for recent times, but for centuries on how to make money in these areas. And so again, if we can just, uh, if we're talking about mentors, say you want real estate, I mean, there's so many great people that could teach you how to make a fortune in real estate, but don't go try and reinvent it and, you know, come up with the ideas on your own. It's there already, right? Dial into it. Sure. Yeah. Good points. Uh, Give out your website and uh, just uh, close it up, uh, wrap it up with any, any additional thoughts. Sure. So for the movie, just head over to www.howthoughtsbecomethings.com. Howthoughtsbecomethings.com. The movie's there and you can watch it. I promise you'll enjoy it. But if you want to connect with me, we've got some really cool things right now that we're doing. Uh, Certainly type my name into YouTube or any other social media and we've got lots of great tools there. But something we're doing right now is if you are interested to grow your wealth and use some of the strategies that I learned from the top achievers, head over to the Income Stream Challenge which is IncomeStreamChallenge.com. And you'll find that there's some really cool tools there for you as well, including a book right now that we just put out called The Truth About Manifesting Money because most people have it wrong. Good stuff, Doug. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.